Thank you very much. Uh, it's truly a pleasure to be here, and uh, I guess as that old country and western song goes, we have a long way to go and a short time to get there. So let's dive right in. And I want to start with this notion that we are incredibly lucky. Now, the last two days I've had to redefine we and us and them and figure that all out. But uh, this isn't just about us in this room, although it's been an exquisite conference to be with so many brilliant and, and well-intentioned people. But I mean this in a more general way that we are extraordinarily lucky to live in this time, to live in this economic time. And this was uh, Brian Arthur, you may have seen this, he published this in the McKinsey Quarterly recently, so therefore it has to be true. Um, <laughs> but this notion that by 2025, the second economy will be as large as the 1995 physical economy. What did he mean by that? Well, the physical economy from, I don't know if fire was discovered or invented, but from that period through the invention of the wheel, the beginning of trade, uh, the beginning of the modern banking system in Renaissance Italy, first industrial revolution, second industrial revolution, the nuclear age, that was the first economy. That was our physical economy. All of that effort to build that. In a 30-year window, with digital technology, we're gonna build a virtual economy of the same scale. We're in the middle of that period. This is an extraordinary time, and it has massive implications for everybody in this room. And so as we get into this, um, I love this quote from uh, Victor Hugo. There's one thing stronger than all the armies of the world, and that's an idea whose time has come. When you look at what we've been seeing being produced by Hollywood, Minority Report, go look at Microsoft's HoloLens technology. It's here today. Terminator 2, such a great movie when that Terminator was just created out of liquid. Um, well, obviously now we have 3D and moving into 4D printing, which is doing that. Star Trek Deep Space Nine, well, now there's Google Glass that provides that same capability. And of course, there's the Google self-driving car. These things will all have massive implications as we go forward. So we're living in this time of an extraordinary shift and consumer technologies are transforming commerce. What do I mean by consumer technologies? I've been watching all of you. We're all consuming these at a rapid scale. And it's the smack stack. So what is the smack stack? I actually came up with this notion a few years ago, a client in a meeting. It was, you know, mobile was too limiting, cloud was too limiting. These four things were coming together. And I was on an airplane, seat 27B with a napkin, literally, and I thought, is it scam or smack? And I thought scam wasn't a good term to go with, so. Uh, <laughs> We ended up with smack, but it's social computing, mobility, advanced analytics, and cloud. And these four are combining to, in very fundamental ways, change commerce, change how you interact with humans, change how we derive value in our economic constructs. And you look at these charts, how quickly this is happening. Um, now, I grew, up, I grew up in the center of the universe, that's better known as Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and mind you, I've heard all the jokes. Live, growing up in Cleveland in the 70s was tough. The river caught on fire. Um, and that was when the city was bankrupt, so I've heard it all. But um, I'm just turning 50 soon, and when I grew up, Kodak was, at least in my world, the iconic brand. And now they've had their Kodak moment. Uh, look what's happened to Blockbuster. In fact, uh, you may not see it from the back of the room, but this is an old Blockbuster sign. And right up there, somebody wrote it and scribbled, laugh out loud, Netflix. Um, <laughs> you see Borders Books. This was a book fair in Union Square in New York City. And this little table here, it's a business book. And the question is, is your business next? Obviously, the management team at Borders did not read the book. Um, <laughs> And then obviously RCA, another iconic brand of probably everybody's childhood in this room, you know, what's happened to RCA. So these things happen fast. It's one of these issues, management teams here would say, we live in those markets where it was slow, 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 all of a sudden. And that's what's about to happen with healthcare. As I travel the world, I work with a lot of senior management teams. Uh, at Cognizant, we're a large company you've probably never heard of. We've got about 220,000 employees. Uh, about a third of those work in healthcare. In fact, uh, we have about 60% of all US healthcare records in our databases through our Trizetto platform. So we do a lot of work in healthcare, but I also do a lot of work outside of the industry. 
And when I would meet with CEOs and management teams, as recent as two years ago, there was this wall of denial. We would talk about the Borders versus Amazon case study, and they'd be dismissive. Ah, oh, that's, that's, that's a book thing. Our business is different. We're highly regulated. The structure's different. So, you know, there's real reasons. We will always have our business model. And yet, you can see, like canaries in the coal mine, they just keep turning over. And this is happening now with incredible regularity. So I love this quote by William Gibson, if you read Gibson's science fiction stuff, but he says, the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. And so that's why we can be lulled to sleep when we define healthcare, when we define how things should be rolled out. You know, many of these presentations the last couple of days, candidly, I got a little frustrated because I thought, yes, these problems around the developing world look like they're unsolvable because you're taking a physical manifestation, a physical paradigm of the industry. But if we start to apply digital around these, can we redefine these problems and address them in completely new ways? And so although it's a bit of a stretch, when I got the challenge, you know, the future in 2030, I was like, I don't know. Um, but it's dangerous to, you know, look out that far. But at the same time, there's some very clear signals, very clear directions, and they're being given to us by other industries. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about those. Um, here's a notion, just to, to give a parallel. Melting points in nature, obviously, um, this is where things will melt, water at zero, and then you can see the other elements. But businesses are melting as well. So quote unquote, the temperature in our economy right now is about that line similar to where water would melt. And look at these industries, classified ads, completely eviscerated. One-tenth as many sold today as were sold 10 years ago in the US and in the UK. Where did they go? They went online, they went to eBay, they went to Craigslist, they went to monster.com, whoop, gone. Same thing with Encyclopedia Britannica. Multi-century-old business, bang, gone. I mean, what are you going to do today? What lunatic is going to go through Encyclopedia? Just look on Wikipedia. It's quite easy. Maps. I won't ask for a show of hands, but when we wanted to walk home last night from that delightful dinner, you're like, going, oh, where's my map? Oh, I got to, you know, it's just one on your iPhone and you walked home. And so these things have gone through these melting points. They have decoupled. To use consultant speak, they have dematerialized. And so when we look going forward, these are the elements that have yet to hit their full melting points, but they're starting to hit them. A lot of work in retail banking right now around payments. What is the role of the branch? Because you think, well, what is money? You know, that physical piece of paper is just a concept. It's just an idea. So it's so easily digitized. So I think there's a little bit of time, but remember this concept. These markets go slow, 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 all of a sudden. And so if you're not taking action today, if you're not making sense of this today, you're going to get all of a sudden in about two to three years. That's where we are. So this is great, but it's also terrifying. Um, and this notion of, well, if this addresses everything, where do I get started? And so with this, with our experiences in helping clients navigate through this, there's six things we know. So I'm just going to spend about five minutes on each of these six. I know it's a frustrating presentation because you can spend three hours on any of these. But just want to give a quick perspective on these six items. So let's dive in the first one, the mobilization of everything. This is something that can't be underestimated. It's a wonderful photo. Photo speaks a thousand words. This um, was, did anybody recognize where that is or what it is? This is the interactive part of the session. Uh, you got it. It's electing the Pope. So it's at the Vatican. Um, and you may not see it, but this is the same news organization. It's the Associated Press. Exactly the same location, exactly the same event. The only separation was eight years. Slightly different photo. So the mobile revolution indeed is being televised. And there are now more mobile phones than toilets in the world. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's a thing. 
It shows us where our collective priorities are. Um, and these numbers, it's only growing at a geometric rate. So if you look at the world population up top, everybody in the room knows that. Um, you can see 2003 through 2020. We crossed the line about half a decade ago or more than that in terms of more connected devices than people. There are more IP addressable connected machines in use every moment than there are humans on Earth. And in fact, look at where we are today. We've gone far past that. We're at about 17 billion, and we're going up, you can see by 2020, end of this decade, 50 billion machines online, instrumented, talking to one another in the internet at all times. As I said, this is a special time. In 20, 30 years, when you go in and type in, I don't know what it would be, I don't even know if you would type, or if it would be Wikipedia, but let's just say Wikipedia in 20 years, and you put in the economy in the teens. I think the first thing that's going to come up is that's the decade that data exploded. And some people and some organizations knew how to harness it and knew what to do with it, and others just whiffed, just missed, didn't see that it was happening. And you can see these numbers are just extraordinary. But it's not just the numbers, it's the power of the machines. Um, this is a retailer in the United States, Radio Shack. Um, and so this is a newspaper ad from 1991. Everything available on this ad for the entire store, you can now buy with those features included on your standard smartphone. So look at all of these, whether it was the computer, the camera, the music player, so forth and so on, the voice recorder, all of these things now, the, the alarm clock uh, available with a standard smartphone. And it, just think what lunatic would have driven into the parking lot, cleaned out the entire store. I mean, this stuff wouldn't have fit in your car. Um, <laughs> and yet it all fits here for $300 US. And we did the math, and just this advertisement, the real terms, it's over $6,000 of stuff. But here's what's extraordinary. So this is an iPhone 6 that I have. It has the computational power of a mouse, of a mouse's brain. Where Moore's Law is going, the iPhone 11, if they keep with their product cycle, <laughs> in seven years, this machine will have the computational power of the average human. If Moore's law continues, by 2045, this machine will have the computational power of all humanity. So you really need to start rethinking when there's a second brain in somebody's pocket and it can control or hold or tap into massive amounts of data how do we rethink Claire? How do we rethink healthcare at an atomic level? And this mobilization of everything, the car is actually gonna be the biggest generator of data by 2020. Uh, this is a IP enabled toothbrush. So it shows the cost. This is not expensive machines. Uh, we, we built this with a client. So this is a toothbrush which is hooked up to the internet. Because it turns out nine out of 10 of us have no idea how to brush our teeth. So look to your left, <laughs> look to your right, <laughs> and why not? Well, it's, you know, what happened to each of us? One of our parents taught us when we were three or four, there endeth the lesson, and how many root canals later? But, so this toothbrush will actually measure how, it'll grade you as you brush your teeth, and then it will then go to your app on your iPhone and say, did you spend the right amount of time? Did you have the right pressure on your molars, the right angle, this, that, the next thing? Um, see, some people are going, TMI, I don't need this. But <laughs> we found a wonderful market for young parents. So the next generation of parents that are teaching their kids. So when Junior comes downstairs and you say, hey, did you brush your teeth? And he goes, all you have to do is go, no, you didn't. <laughs> Back upstairs. But the point is, it shows the collapsing price point. Price is no longer an inhibitor 
to these technologies when you can put it in a toothbrush. Wearables. Uh, the explosion of wearables is just remarkable. And when you can start to track all of these mobile devices. So uh, this is, shows the mobile operating systems in use at night in New York City. Now, in the U.S., it's different in different markets. In the United States and Europe, there's a significant correlation between operating systems and socioeconomic status. That is, middle income, middle class up buys Apple, middle class down buys Samsung or Android. And so this map almost correlates perfectly to that. You can see the outline of Manhattan, Upper West Side, Upper East Side. Here's Newark. Um, <laughs> now these little purple dots, these are the hyper wealthy. This is Wall Street bankers that for security reasons still have to use their Blackberries. So, um, <laughs> so they wish they were red, but they're still purple. Um, but this, other interesting things, these a real time view of Uber riders in San Francisco get very clear maps. Um, popular jogging paths in Boston. So these are people that just you know, use their apps, you track the data, you see where they run, you correlate, add it all up, and you recognize people in the back bay, pretty fit, around MIT, quite fit, Chelsea Revere, not so much. Um, <laughs> sorry, somebody live in Chelsea. Um, <laughs> So if Socrates were around today, you know, he said that an unexamined life is not worth living. Um, well, he probably wouldn't go in philosophy today. I mean, the big three philosophy firms are not hiring. Um, he'd probably be working at Google. But uh, if he were there, he'd probably say something like the uninstrumented life is not worth living, where we have this ability now to instrument almost every aspect of life. And so with that, I asked this room, what can be rethought around health care? What can be rethought around outcomes when we could instrument most everything? How much guesswork would be taken out of disease management if you could see maps in real time like those? Those are silly notions. Who's carrying an apple in their pocket? But when we get other issues that are much more serious and things are instrumented, how does that start to change things? So mobility is uh, it's extraordinary what's happening. But let me get to digitization of process. Because most everybody gets the mobile thing, but this is the one that trips a lot of firms up. This is why Kodak died. This is why Blockbuster died, is mobilization or digitization of process. So Ian was talking about Michael Porter. I put this slide up. I love putting this slide up because I can recognize the MBAs in a second. They all just break out in hives. They're like, ugh, I spent four months of my life on that thing. Um, this is a Michael Porter model of a typical company. Um, when I talked about the industrial economy, the physical economy, this is the physical instantiation of a business. So just take a typical manufacturer. So you can see in the blue, this could be a car manufacturer. Inbound logistics to the factory, then you've got production in the factory, outbound logistics, get the cars out to the dealers, you sell it at the dealership, and then you service the car as it you know, goes through its life cycle. So, and then you have the support functions that support it. This is where people get trapped. It's when, when Churchill talked about this, when he said, first we create or we define our institutions and then our institutions define us. We've seen this in so many industries. You can tell when somebody joined the industry because their theory of the business is often based on a model such as this. Here's the problem. This was designed for widgets. It was not designed for digits. This is why markets are changing so fast. So when you think of healthcare delivery, this is where Blockbuster, if they wanted to rent a video to somebody in northern Idaho, what did they have to do? Well, they had to go find a physical place and rent out that corner location and then staff it up and then put all the videos on the shelves and hope that somebody walked in to rent that video. How does Netflix deliver that to that person in northern Idaho? That nth customer cost nothing. Boop, it happens. And so this is where digits start to dominate widgets with these models. Now what's gonna happen though is hybrid wins. So you say, oh, should we become Google? No, nobody in this room is gonna become Google. And the reason is, is because some parts of the business model must remain physical. 
when that person's having open heart surgery, ain't gonna happen digitally. So absolutely, portions of the business, portions of the model will always, always, always be physical. But think through which of those are actually knowledge-based and should go digital. If we started today, they should go digital, and you start to get to a business model that becomes uncoupled like this. So this is where I love the value equation from the last session, because you get completely new economies of scale, new economies of scope, and radically lower transaction costs when you start to get to these digital processes. That's easily, more easily said than done. This is what makes your hair hurt is to look at your organization and say, okay, I think I get that, but where do I start? What goes where? What goes digital? What stays physical? How are they harmonized? You know, who runs it? How do I manage that transition? And so you look at things, this is, I threw this in because this was some conversation the last couple of days. Um, I think if we had a euro for every time Uber came up, well, we might have 27 euros, it's not that much, but, um, <laughs> Nevertheless, it came up a lot. Um, so, you know, you, it, it gives us a perspective. Look at this organization and how fast it has grown. This slide's already out of date. It's like 53 countries now. Uh, $41 billion valuation. In fact, this has gone up. They're out raising another $2 billion, and their pre-money now is $50 billion. So um, it's extraordinary. To put that in perspective, General Motors, who's been at this now for over 100 years, is worth... 53 billion. So this becomes a head shaker. You're like, shame on them. How do these established organizations let these new entrants come in with very few assets and build this kind of value? And well, it's obvious. They're like, well, what a, what a parlor trick Uber's pulled off. You keep all the heavy physical assets. I'll just harvest the data that's coming off of them. And the same is, I don't own the drivers. I just harvest the data coming off of them. And now it's the value of the virtual. We're gonna look back 20 years from now and go, how did they get away with that? Well, they got away with it because they're early. And when you look at this, obviously it's creating lots of change. In Boston, for example, a taxi medallion, April 2014, cost $700,000, the right to go drive a taxi. You know what the value is today? There is no value because no bank will provide anybody a loan to go get a medallion because they don't know what one is worth. It's like trying to catch a falling knife. And so this is what's happening. Now, of course, the taxi drivers, you may remember this. This happened in London. It happened all across Europe. Um, they went on strike. Uh, they said, this shall not stand. Well, this is what happened, actually. You know, Uber, after that strike, said it had seen a surge in demand Wednesday, particularly in London, with customers rushing in to download the app. We've seen our biggest day of signups in London today since our launch two years ago, said the spokesperson. In fact, today we're seeing an 850% increase in signups compared to last Wednesday. People know a good idea when they see it. And so this is where these markets tend to move very quickly. Obviously, Uber now, you can get a rickshaw in New Delhi uh, through Uber. It's finding applicability in developed markets as quickly, if not faster, than it has in the developed world. And so you start to see how can we take this around things like patient diagnosis. And so using apps like this, like CellScope, sitting on a mobile phone, how could we capture that data instantly and start to digitize the process as opposed to it getting trapped physically and never finding its way to the right place. And so in the same way that Uber has changed that model, I asked the question to everybody in the room, now that much of healthcare delivery is potentially decoupled, what is the art of the possible? And not only what can, but what will become quote unquote Ubered. And so we'll talk at the end of a homework assignment to go through and try to figure that out. All right. So using the mobile devices that in the context of a digital process leads to probably the most important thing is perverse or pervasive analytics. As I was saying, the smack stack is creating this big data quagmire, and you've seen data like this. You know, how much data is being generated each day? I mean, it's a lot of YouTube videos, but it's much more than that now. Um, you know, 90% of the world's data was just generated in the last two years. 
And we're going to get to a point next year where that's going to be going at a 12-month clip as opposed to a 24-month clip. It's just amazing this time we live in. But here's the problem. Most organizations only see static. By the way, that's the pinnacle of the PowerPoint experience. It doesn't get any better than that. Um, <laughs> where others can see the signal through the noise and start to make sense. And so when we wrote this book, my colleagues and I, Code Halos, we started with that question. Why did these companies win? Because it wasn't obvious at first. I remember when Google came out, shows how much I know, I thought, great, that's the last thing the world needs, another search engine. Because this is back when we had Yahoo and AltaVista and AOL and all the rest. Um, I didn't get Boolean search at the time. Or when Facebook came out, there was MySpace. MySpace should have won, didn't. So we tried to take a look at why did these organizations do so well, and they all did it with code halos. So what is a code halo? Well, first of all, look at what they did. It was historic economically. They generated over a trillion dollars of market value in a 10-year window. Had never been done before, but it's going to happen again. I think this is just the first trillion dollar club. And as Dr. Shetty was describing yesterday, the large percentage of the economy that is healthcare related. This is going to happen in healthcare. If we come back to this conference in 10 years, we're going to say, ah, oh, wow, you know, we had the trillion dollar club in healthcare. But look at this. You know, 2003 value of these companies added up to 34 billion. The last day of 2013, it was 1.2. In fact, last week, it was 1.6 billion or trillion US of cumulative market value of just these six organizations. And so it's quite remarkable, but how do, what do they, how do they do this? Because it's like they're reading your mind. So when I was a boy growing up in Cleveland, we didn't have much, but we had rock and roll. We thought, you know, rock and roll hall of fame, and um, we had this radio station, WMMS. I thought it was just such a wonderful radio station. And in my adult life, I always thought, wow, that's, that was always the best radio station. Until the first time I heard Pandora, it blew my mind. I just put in three artists and just song after song. I'm like, how did they know? It, it felt like a parlor trick. How does this company in California never met me? In fact, I only logged in 45 minutes ago, and all of a sudden these songs keep coming, cascading at me that I just adore. How do they do that? And it's not a parlor trick. They do it with data. They know the virtual me. So a code halo is your virtual you. So we all have our physical you, but now you have a virtual you, and your virtual you, which is created, any noun, any person, place, or thing, has a virtual self as well as a physical self, and every time you go online, you're just leaving digital cookie crumbs. You're leaving exhaust. And the firms that know how to make sense of this are the firms that are winning. So that's me. Um, and here's some attributes of mine. You know, married father of four, Scottish mother from the Midwest of, Ohio, of the US. But this one on the right at, at 3 o'clock. So my musical taste, I like grunge music. So be it. Uh, so I listen to Nirvana and Pearl Jam and all that stuff. Well, why does musical taste matter? Look at these correlations. And as I go through these, think of the possibilities in healthcare when you start to see this new world of big data and correlation that's happening in something as silly as entertainment. But this is just one of their early industries, and you can see how powerful this could become. So, and I apologize, this is a bit of an American context, but this was an American study. So, in the US, if you like Garth Brooks, and say that's one of my favorite artists, it turns out more than 93% of the time you will vote to the right. <laughs> now, that may just be a hat thing. Um, and you look at that and you're like, well, that's sort of obvious. That's a, that's a one-question IQ test. I got that. Um, well, you know, it happens similarly. People who say that Madonna is one of my favorite artists, more than 90% of the time, they vote to the left. Um, again, it could be a hat thing. Um, but uh, And at that age, he's probably sitting there saying, I wish I was in Prague with this, this thing in my mouth. Um, but uh, other correlations. This gets very interesting very quickly. So Justin Timberlake, if that's one of your favorite artists, it turns out you like Pixar films. <laughs> if you like Jimi Hendrix, 
it turns out that you will like to read science fiction novels. Very close correlation between those two. Uh, those who like Seattle grunge music, when the Academy Award list comes out every year, you agree with it. <laughs> Very strange taste-wise, but there's some country music singers like Kenny Chesney. If that's one of your favorite artists, that Academy Award list comes out every year, and it's a mystery. You're like, I, I don't like, I've never heard of half of these films. Um, so it's, it's interesting how these things happen. Other things, recreational drug use. Um, you know, your views, for example, on legalizing marijuana. Uh, I put this slide up with hesitancy because I always find the Dutch people, they attack me afterwards, and they're like, it always has to be the Dutch. Um, <laughs> but uh, other things, your views on romance, your specific views, for example, on premarital sex, uh, your relationship status, are you single, are you with somebody, are you married, are you happily married, unhappily married, is it complicated? Um, that becomes clear with the music that you're listening to. Um, <laughs> Facebook published this, I don't know why, but I think their lawyers probably told them to do it. Um, you may have seen this. Facebook can watch you fall in love. So it's hard to read, but in the middle here is day zero. So here to the left, days before a relationship starts, days here after a relationship starts, and then the number of messages that go between these people. So. Um, that's statistically valid. A very clear <laughs> pattern. There's a business in here. You know, Facebook should just right about here say, can you get on with it? Um, and obviously, they've got better things to do. I mean, there's no. <laughs> I'm going to press the green button, no? Um, oh, by the way, I'm going to press, I'm going to go back. Just one thing. Um, we have a large banking client that now can recognize when you're going to divorce. So joint checking accounts, they can see the activity in the account, and it's a very clear indicator when people are going to divorce, and it's created ethical issues for them that should they intervene, because they said 10% of the time, they have to get called, you know, somebody just empties the account, and it's a mess, and they're like, we knew that three months ago. Um, <laughs> other things about musical tastes. Your family background becomes very clear. Birth order becomes clear. Um, you know, she's going to be a Metallica fan. Um, but uh, other things, these are a bit controversial. Your age. It turns out, regardless of what society you, you grew up in, your musical taste got locked in right about your college years, 18 to 24. And you think you evolve. You're like, oh, no, I've really evolved. Um, no, you're just climbing different branches on that tree, but you can recognize the trunk. So they can your age can be determined quite clearly. Another one, your intelligence. Um, if you don't believe this one, uh, go to this website, musicthatmakesyoudumb.com. Um, <laughs> and so up here are board scores of American high school students correlated to the music that they're listening to. So, um, you know, shocker, that 15-year-old listening to Beethoven as their favorite is quite bright, but uh, you can see where these others start to fall out. <laughs> so why do I go through all of that? If you want to best understand this person, we're working with hospitals now where they're starting on very simple applications. Um, instead of calling the nurse for ice chips or whatever on the button, well, they all have iPads. So just have an app on the iPad where they can start to do that. And what happens is they start to build their health code, Halo. So it's in the hospital, and then it's in recovery, and then when they go home, you have gamification and the rest. And it builds this very rich profile so that if that person does return to the hospital, you understand where they are physically, emotionally, psychologically, how they react to certain things. And so when you look at this person, do you, instead of viewing them physically, start to understand that patient's code halo and exactly where they are, what their exact needs, experiences, and preferences are. And I love this quote, we should become data donors. So just like we should sign up as organ donors, we should also become data donors. And I think it's a, a, a concept which, whose time has come. And so you can see now apps like this, myhealthpal.com, where you can actually donate, uh, you know, it's, it's anonymous, but donate your data and then actually get a share of the revenues coming back in return. So uh, we're starting to see these schemes come up which should help. And you look at the emergence of digital healthcare now, uh, we see over 400 technologies in this explosion, 9,000 apps. 
So this is all going to shake out, but you can see that the race is on um, around tracking health status, uh, emotional state, your social environment, your behavior, so forth and so on. And so this medical code halo starts to emerge. And so it becomes very clear. Uh, she has wet earwax, strong chance of developing uh, severe nearsightedness, average odds of getting migraine headaches, so forth and so on. This view of a patient becomes very pixelated, very clear. You know, it's remarkable what's happened in the entertainment world, but now it's coming to health. These weird notions of how does Amazon know my taste in literature better than my brother? How does Netflix know what I want to watch on a Sunday night movie better than my wife? Very weird, and yet that's the revolution that should be coming to healthcare quite soon. I know it's scary. I know it raises lots of ethical issues. We will get to that, but it's happening. Now, so the question is, how can Code Halos be leveraged to deliver healthcare at entirely new levels of cost and entirely new levels of quality? And that's, I think, and so it's not a function of first world versus third world. This is very important. It's not a function of public versus private. It's a function of instrumented versus non-instrumented. So I went in, I got my annual physical, I don't know, three months ago. I walked into the parking lot after my physical, it just went, uh, he told me I was healthy. I was like, who the hell knows? You know, what could be lurking inside of me? Nobody knows, because um, what did he do? Well, Malcolm, have you been smoking? No. How many drinks do you have a week? You know, I lied. Um, <laughs> he's like, well, you know, you stand to lose a few pounds. Are you stressed at home? How's work? You know, and that was it. I was thinking, my goodness gracious. And for me, knowing what these instrumented worlds look like compared to what that archaic, it just felt like I had walked back a generation ago. It was a very strange moment for me. Okay, three more. This one will be quick. Got to make it beautiful. Um, Dr. Shetty talked about this. In fact, I'll bring this up. But software is becoming the new brand battleground. Most company systems look like that dog, and most customers or patients look like that. Um, Because your systems may look like this. Built for what? Captive users. You know, in the English language, at least, that word user, in what other connotation is it positive? Um, <laughs> uh, Joe's back at it. He's a, he's a user. Um, <laughs> why don't you hang out with Susan anymore? Well, she's a user. Um, and so these systems, they need to look like this. They need to be beautiful. They need to be intuitive. They don't come with manuals. If somebody can't start using it in three minutes, you've lost. So at Cognizant, as I was saying, we're a big company. We've got over 200,000 employees, and most of our people code. They live very sedentary lifestyles, and so they get big. Um, so we created this internally um, around a patient halo and also some motivation to get people walking. We had gamification, weight loss challenges, and the rest. And, um, but it had to look like this. It had to look beautiful. It had to be you know, their goals, their sleep patterns, their calories in and out, uh, where they are, their vitals, all of these things that start to show up in a very clean, beautiful, intuitive interface. And obviously, around the world, particularly in the developing world, you, you can't take these Western notions and just try to jam them in. Context matters. So, to be immersed in the user experience, to identify critical insights and opportunities, and how is that mobile device being used in Ethiopia versus how it may be used in England, obviously is extraordinarily important. So uh, we did some work, uh, Dr. Shetty referred to this yesterday, around the fully instrumented uh, and paperless intensive care unit. Um, and so you can see it's fully instrumented, meaning the patient, the doctor, the nurse, the machines. And so in doing this, there's near real-time patient diagnosis. You can see the data on any patient, up to five gig per patient, more than 150 parameters in real-time views shared with the doctors and with the nurses. And as he described yesterday, look at these target rates, reducing mortality by 20%, improving nurse productivity by 35%, and lowering the average patient stay telling me I got five minutes. That's my bell. All right, so I got to move a little bit quick. Number five, 
Transactions to journeys. This is important, and this has happened in the retail world, but it's coming to healthcare. Most organizations do transactions very, very well. So what's a transaction? Somebody goes in for a surgical procedure. That transaction, beginning to end. But the firms that are winning in business are now those that can manage your full journey. So Amazon, when you go order that book, they fulfill that really well, that incremental transaction. But the magic of Amazon is they know your entire journey. That's how they can build that code halo and start to build that relationship with you. And so probably the best definition I heard of big data is how do you affect events as events are unfolding? That's why I thought about the Claire story so much yesterday. In an instrumented, data-rich world 10, 20 years from now that she or her daughter may be living in, how does that scenario totally change? How do, event, you know, how do those events change as they're unfolding when there's all of that information readily available. So how do you manage the overall patient journey on the culmination of all transactions? That it goes from physician-centered to patient-focused, isolated individual to one who's socially connected. This is very important. This is shown up, for example, you may have seen that second point on weight loss applications, very rudimentary world, but Lose It was a platform that wasn't doing well. So it's just one of these simple apps on your phone, I want to lose 20 pounds, and you put in how much you exercise, what you ate, and it tries to track it. When they went social, it took off. Meaning, if you're a you know, 220 pound male of a certain background, certain age, certain demographic, and want to lose 10 pounds, they will connect you socially online with 20 other people who look just like you, and you become this community that just tries to inspire one another and work with one another, and they found that that changes behavior significantly. Um, you know, sick care to health and well-being. Uh, we, we're doing a lot with this right now. Uh, Post-diabetic patients um, with their insurance schemes, that they can wear um, a Fitbit. And so we've got several clients where we're doing this. The data is fascinating when you come through this to understand what motivates people to actually move forward and not. We found one person, he was a very large man, um, it looked like he cracked the three-minute mile. Uh, one of our people looked in the database and said, that's, that's an impossibility. How did he do that? Um, well, it turned out he was taking the Fitbit off, throwing it in the dryer, running it for 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> so people do cheat, but uh, nevertheless. Um, but, you know, it's, it's how do you start to change the whole patient process from awareness, you know, the moment when they're diagnosed with something, the moment when they realize they're out of their depth, I don't know what I'm doing with this disease, um, you know, the treatment, you know, how do you identify these moments of truth and manage through it? How do you resolve these challenges? Um, and then patient activation, where technology can motivate somebody to start to take control, start to harness things through wearables, gamification and analytics. We've seen with these cases, around disease management, when somebody can be brought in, and as you saw with that dashboard, that black dashboard earlier, um, there's gamification and it goes social. It's remarkable how people get competitive around these things. You know, Uber, people brag about their Uber scores. They actually put them on their resumes now. And so the same thing is starting to happen here, that people's egos get involved, and whereas, I mean, we all know this in this room, you know, it's to get somebody to take their, med their meds, you know, quite often it's just family pressure. If their daughter pushes them or their spouse pushes them, you know, just taking the medicine goes way up. But you can take this to a whole new level through gamification, and then it drives behavior change at the end. So managing this full customer life cycle through digital technology, um, I think is an idea whose time has certainly come. Okay, last one on ethics. This is a Pandora's box in a bit. And I, you know, this is another one of those topics we could spend hours and hours, but I'll just give a, a slight taste since, since we're out of time. Uh, number one is, as an organization, don't snoop. The good news is most healthcare organizations, this is in your DNA, you don't snoop. Privacy is number one. Uh, we see other industries, this is a problem. Um, telcos and the rest, it's not yet in. Um, if somebody wants to opt in to sharing all this healthcare information, they can do that. But if they decide, you know what, I'm uncomfortable that this organization has this, we'll just let them delete it. Amazon and Google are now doing this. You can go in and delete your history with those companies. Uh, that should be allowed as well. Um, some correlations are creepy. 
You may know the story. Uh, this was a retailer in the United States, Target. It turned out that the store figured out a 16-year-old girl was pregnant before her parents did. Um, and they started sending mailers to the house. Oh, you're in your first trimester? You may want to buy this stuff. Um, <laughs> Because they recognize these data correlations. Women who find out they're pregnant go and buy certain products in combination. This girl had done that. And so um, you know, some correlations are creepy. This is an important one. The law will never catch up. This was discussed in a number of the sessions the last couple of days. Don't wait for the law. It won't catch up. It just won't. Sorry. And so. These, there's digital companies that are just figuring their way, finding their way. This is where Google says, don't be evil. But they say that because they're just finding their way with the law. And it's going to happen with you as well. Let me give one example. We're seeing this in insurance. We're working with a lot of insurance firms that are going digital. So there's a revolution in insurance where it goes from one to many to one to one. Same thing's going to happen in healthcare. But in the one to many there, it's, for example, auto insurance. So you can get a telematics device. So you can get one of these things, stick it in your cigarette lighter, and it actually tracks your car as you drive around town. Now, some people think that's dystopian, that's big brother, that's really frightening, but other people say, hey, I'm a good driver, $200 a month off my bill, done, done and done. Um, here's the issue. That machine is so sensitive, because it tracks all the G-forces, it knows your speed on a road relative to the speed limit, all of it's tracked and put in a database. It can recognize drunk driving behavior. So we're gonna face it, it's gonna happen where somebody plows somebody over on a Saturday night and kills them. And then there's a legal proceeding and a discovery process. And they're going to say, that insurance company knew. In fact, they knew for a long time. They knew every Friday and Saturday night that so-and-so got behind the wheel of his car and was driving drunk. And it happened on the 21st time, but they saw it happen 20 times before that. Well, what do you do? And so, you're going to see lots and lots of these scenarios where there are real ethical and legal issues that need to be addressed as you go digital. And so we say, appoint a chief digital risk officer. This is somebody probably in the general counsel's office who really understands IT and data and the law and ethics, who can help you navigate and manage through these things because there is going to be a gray area as you go digital. So how does, how does everybody in this room provide leadership and ensure that lapses in security ethics don't slow the promise of digital healthcare? Okay, um, I am out of time, so I'm gonna skip these charts and just get to my final one, which is, actually, let me just give the, this one. Um, in your organization, don't waste any time convincing anybody. Don't try to change people's minds. Just find your champions. Find your people who believe in this and want to go. They are there. Just grab that team and move. And don't waste your time with anybody else. And we've seen this again and again and again. And the time, you know, maybe 10 years or five years ago, it was too soon. But in 2018, it's going to be too late. So the time is now to get started, to build the pilots, to understand what's happening in other industries. And why does this matter? One final thought about the future. We've had two presentations on the future. And I love this definition or a final thought on the future. That when it comes to the future, there are three kinds of people. Uh, the first are those who make it happen. Um, the second are those who let it happen. And then the third are those who wonder what happened. <laughs> and through our deep research, we found it's better to be in categories one or two rather than category three. So uh, with that, I thank you very much for the opportunity. And uh, thanks so much.